together with Gould, Professor Niall Seldridge, one of Gould's closest friends and colleagues, for many years curators of the Division of Invertebrate Paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, and one of the most important evolutionists in the world. Um, I suppose that Niall uh, disagrees with uh, Richard Lewont's interpretation of untreated equilibria, and uh, he, he will show it now. And many thanks, Niles, for accepting our invitation. And now it will be a pleasure to listen to you. Many thanks. OK. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Telmo. Um, and also to Professor Daniele and the Instituto. I think it was a wonderful occasion. And I'm very happy to have been invited to take part here. Um, yes. as. Uh, Tomo said, I, I don't agree entirely with Dick Lewinton's characterization of punctuated equilibria, and you'll see why. So uh, bear with me. I will read this talk. I usually don't, but this, this is a very complicated subject, and it's an emotional subject, so I'll read. When Steve Gould died on May 20th, 2002, he was arguably the most famous scientist in America and perhaps in the entire world ranking right up there with predecessors like Margaret Mead and Carl Sagan. Much of this fame was, of course, engendered by Steve's so-called popular writing, but Steve told me long ago that successful writing styles do not change to embrace wider audiences, only the vocabulary changes. Steve felt that all of his writings, from the more narrowly technical to the most broadly engaging, were of the same intrinsic uh, merit reflecting fundamentally his same intellectual values. <clears throat> Steve owed his success in large measure to his skill in making his readers feel that they are directly involved in his intellectual adventures. But it was as fledgling paleontologists and evolutionary theorists that Steve and I first met, forging a lasting bond that in less than a decade produced what was probably Steve's and my own arguably most important and certainly well-known piece of scientific work, the theory of punctuated equilibrium. My goal today is to explore aspects of the educational experiences we shared along with fellow students in the geology and to a lesser degree zoology departments at Columbia University in the mid-1960s. To reflect on Steve's talents and proclivities as a young, career-minded scientist in those years, Dick was correct about that, and to characterize the circumstances and especially the underlying evolutionary issues and empirical data that led to the publication of Punctuated Equilibria in the early 1970s. I will conclude with a brief analysis of the deep, if forgotten, intellectual roots of punctuated equilibria, and concluding that both allopatric speciation and what we call punctuated equilibria, both clearly conceived by Darwin but never published, simply had to be rediscovered and elaborated on in the 20th century. Steve, <coughs> Steve Gould showed up on the Columbia's ca campus in the fall of 1963 newly graduated from Antioch College, and now enrolled in the Invertebrate Paleontology Program at Columbia's Department of Geology. He was joined significantly, I think, by at least a half dozen other aspiring paleontologists or stratigraphers, among whom was H.B. Rollins. Most of these new students went on to have productive and distinguished careers. I think the sheer size of this entry class was critical to the dynamics of the learning process, as they did, as students often do, take their intellectual life largely into their own hands. In the fall of 1963, I was a junior in college, and having I saw I was an undergraduate, and having decided that I would stay in the academic world, I was trying to make up my mind <clears throat> whether I would go into physical anthropology or geology and paleontology. I was smitten by this intellectually active new group of graduate students and was delighted that they let me hang around. John Imbry was then the invertebrate paleontologist on the Columbia campus with Norman Newell and Roger Batten at the American Museum of Natural History, acting as adjuncts <clears throat> in the Columbia Geology Department. I was taking in Imbry's introductory paleontology, followed the next semester by biostratigraphy, which was open to graduate students. But the really important thing was that, probably with Steve as the ringleader, the new graduate students saw that there was little in the way of evolution in the curriculum. So they started their own seminar, and they let me join in. 
<clears throat> we read extensively and taking turns, each of us led discussions. At one point, I did a session on macroevolution. This was when Steve's influence on us all quickly emerged. He, Steve, believed that no one should wait until they are 60, which ironically was the age when he died, before they start actively thinking, talking, and writing about theoretical issues, and for that matter, publishing on them. <coughs> Paleontology then is now, <coughs> excuse me, was usually split between invertebrate and vertebrate programs. And at Columbia, at least, vertebrate paleontology, ever since the days of Henry Fairfield Osborne in the last decade of the 19th century, lay in the province of zoology. I think there's more pollen in Venice than I thought there would be. Now biology department. Invertebrate paleontology was seen as the more intrinsically biological subject with its focus on the anatomy of fossil bones and their relevance to deciphering phylogenetic relationships. That was the supposed route to take if one wanted to contemplate evolutionary issues uh, from the standpoint of the fossil record. In contrast, invertebrate paleontology was usually pursued in geology uh, programs. Certainly this was always the case at Columbia. Though some invertebrate paleontologists, including Norman Newell, who was mentor to both Steve and myself, had active interest in ecology and evolution, traditionally invertebrate paleontology had been studied largely as a means of correlating rocks, thus producing a repeatedly tested framework of geological time. And though much of the interest in this aspect of invertebrate paleontological research lay in its economic implications for the search for oil and gas reserves, the discipline of biostratigraphy, which is the distribution in time and space of species in the fossil record, especially as developed in the 19th century in Europe, going all the way back as far as Cuvier, had clear implications for understanding patterns, thus potentially processes of evolution. So why did Steve Gould, so famous for having fallen in love with the American Museum's Tyrannosaurus at age five, decide to pursue invertebrate paleontology rather than the more traditionally biologically and evolutionarily minded vertebrate paleontology. I think the main reason was simply Steve's undergraduate experience with the invertebrate paleontologist J.F. White at Antioch, which is where Steve was an undergraduate. Steve's very first paper published with Dr. White in 1965 was on the meaning of B in the famous equation Y equals BX to the K used variously to describe allometric growth of individuals, series of individuals within populations, or even evolutionary changes between closely related species in a lineage. Steve had discovered, or Professor White had shown him, an unwrapped, unstudied collection of Bermudan Pleistocene land snails in the basement of the geology department at Antioch. And Steve had been smitten with the growth, geometric growth of these well-preserved snails and had vowed one day to make them the subject of his doctoral dissertation. Few people arrive at graduate school already knowing the precise topic of their future PhD dissertation, but Steve did. A glance at Steve's earliest entries on his prodigious uh, bibliography, and Telmo showed us some of this, reveal his passion for growth and form, and for mo morphology in general. We were all aghast when Steve took an entire year off from his doctoral research to answer the invitation from the journal Biological Reviews to write a review on the literature on, of the literature on the llama tree, an opportunity Steve used to make fresh observations on the subject, especially its relationship to evolution. Steve saw that invitation as a golden opportunity, and as was to be his hallmark, he jumped on the chance and worked extremely hard on it. I've always said that I never met anyone so smart who worked so hard as Steve Gould. He was establishing a reputation as an original thinker on theoretical issues and laying the groundwork both in substance and style for his first, first book, Ontogeny and Phylogeny, as uh, Telmo showed us, published in 1977. Thus, Steve at heart was first and always a morphologist and develop, de developmentalist, and that's important. I think that was his basic way of looking at the world. One of his most important and original insights came towards the end of the 1970s when he was among the first to point out that regulatory genes 
depending upon their actions and when in ontogeny they are switched on, can have a disproportionately large effect on modifying adult morphologies in the evolutionary process, long since a central tenet of evo-devo, evolutionary developmental biology. And I must also say, in an evolutionary context, he was as much of an adaptation, a, a, adaptationist as the next person. I know it sounds strange to say so, given his reputation as a critic of hyper-adaptationism and his search for alternative explanations for morphological change in evolution, as witness his enthusiasm for original, uh, Elizabeth Verber's original concept of exaptation. All that is true, but at heart, Steve was always a neo-Darwinian, as am I, and so are we all. So I think there's a big misunderstanding about how far outside of the fold Steve got, or Steve and I got. Um, Dick was right about the exceptions and, and the alternate explanations that Steve loved to find about morphological change and evolution. But in, the, in his heart, he was always a neo-Darwinian. He believed in adaptation, and he believed it happened through natural selection. Once, after a seminar at the American Museum sometime in 1965, uh, when I had graduated from Columbia College and had taken my own place in the uh, Columbia Graduate Program, Steve said in mock despair, sometimes I think that man will renounce natural selection on his deathbed, referring to our august mentor, Norman D. Newell. Now, I must get this slide. Is my show even on? Is it on? Oh, good. There we go. I have to say, it's a pity. When we were kids, we didn't take photographs. We had no cell phones, we had no cameras, we didn't take pictures of each other. I have very few pictures of Steve. This is Norman Newell's 90th birthday um, at, at, uh, at the American Museum, and Steve came up for it, and there I am with, with Norman Newell. So that's one of my few pictures that I actually have personally. Newell, we were slowly beginning to realize, well, I would say, referring to Norman Newell, who seemed to include everything but natural selection when discussing the history of life and how it all came to be with his students. So he was our mentor. We were in graduate school in the 1960s, and Norman was much younger. We were all much younger <laughs> back then. Newell, we were slowly beginning to realize, was the only person in the mid-20th century who took patterns of what we now call mass extinctions seriously and insisted that they deserve special study to elucidate their causes. He also insisted that they periodically have an enormous impact, both liter literally and figuratively, on the history of life, thus opening the door still further to seeing a causal interrelationship between evolution and its converse, extinction. For a time, we Callow graduate students openly wished Newell would discuss evolution, not extinction emphasize the positive, not the negative. And it was only later, indeed, not really until the 1980s, when we were immersed in our professional pursuits at different institutions, that the Alvarez hypothesis on the end, hypothesis on the end Cretaceous mass extinction made such headlines, and it began to become clear that much, if not all, evolution occurs only after episodes of ecosystem disruption sufficiently widespread and severe to cause the extinction of entire species, and in the most dramatic and easily seen cases of higher taxa, large groups of organisms. But how exactly to study evolution in the invertebrate fossil record? After all, with just the remains of their exoskeletons, it was often hard to discern the adaptive significance of much of the morphology of invertebrate fossils. So Dick was right about that. No one back in the 1960s knew that evolutionary theory literally had begun with the work of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck in France in 1801 and Jean-Baptiste de Bocchi here in Italy in 1814, both of whom had brought a quantitative aspect to their consideration of tertiary mollusks. Lamarck started out thinking about evolution, looking at fossils, and so did Bocchi. But, on the other hand, Norman Newell had already conducted several studies on evolutionary lineages in Upper Paleozoic bivalves, clams, in the 1940s, 
And Tom Waller, an older graduate student working under Newell at the American Museum, was already deeply immersed in a detailed study of scallop evolution in the tertiary of the Atlantic and Gulf Coast deposits of North America. Tom was using bivariate statistics as a cornerstone of his characterization and comparison of scallop morphologies in space and time. And then there was the simple fact that it was the 1960s and computers were just appearing on major university campuses. Columbia got its first IBM 1790-1794 computer system sometime around the mid-1960s and many of us soon found ourselves scurrying over to the computer center clutching shoe boxes crammed with those old IBM punch cards. And we were lucky that John Imbrie, picking up on the newly found passion for multivariate statistical analysis, then beginning to infiltrate geology in general, introduced all of us who were adventurous to the intricacies and potential analytic power of factor analysis, multivariate analysis of variance, the Mahalanobis D squared statistic, and other arcane statistical delights. Steve was already immersed in statistical analysis with his interest in allometry, and my second published paper was entitled Convergence of Two Pennsylvanian Gastropod Species, a Multivariate Mathematical Approach. So in other words, we were using advanced statistical techniques in computers already as graduate students um, analyzing the fossils. In short, circumstances themselves converged to cry out for studies of evolution of the fossil record. We quickly saw that whatever the disadvantages that many invertebrate fossil taxa have for old-fashioned evolutionary studies purporting to document adaptive change through time, these were more than outweighed by the availability of statistically meaningful samples in well-chosen stu study, uh, study groups. In other words, many specimens and one time different places, and through time. One more factor played a key role in these studies. Dobzhansky and Meyer, still dominant figures in New York, had, had shown in the 1930s and 1940s the critical importance of geography and isolation in the evolutionary process. This is one thing that uh, Dick Lewinton did not address at all. It would be as important to study patterns of geographic variation in more or less contemporaneous populations within a lineage as it would be to chart the course of morphological change and, as it quickly turned out, the non-change we later called stasis through time. Steve stuck to his guns and did his Pleistocene Bermudan land snails, calling it as an early example of the apt, often perfect metaphor as he became famous for, a microcosm. The snails were isolated there on this small island of Bermuda, preserved in sediments for reflecting two contrasting sorts of environmental conditions. He had no idea that in studying fossils of a lineage of which there were still living, surviving species, he was actually working on what I have come to see recently as the Ur question, the original question of evolutionary biology, which was the search for a natural causal explanation for the origin of species in the modern biota. I think that was what drove Lamarck, that's what drove Jean-Baptiste Broca. That's really what started it all. In contrast, I went to the Paleozoic, a disadvantage as the old timers like Broca saw, because none of the species present as fossils in the Devonian had anything directly to do with the origin of our modern fauna. But I had complex anatomy, my fossils were trilobites or arthropods and large populations spanning nearly half the North American continent in breadth, as well as prodigious amounts of geological time, six to eight million years, now considered to have been closer to six than eight million years. In a nutshell, I found that my trilobites, my phacops rana, showed such, such stability, such lack of change through time, that I despaired of finding any evolution at all. Now, I'll show you the fundamental pattern and the original example of punctuated equilibria. I won't go into the details. Um, that's my trilobite from the Devonian. What I was seeing was stability, which is the vertical lines, solid lines, variation in populations geographically, but basically no net change. Most of the change happens rapidly, and it happens in isolated populations. That's the pattern. Um, I, saw it, I saw evolution happening laterally, and it was clear that the allopatric model, the, the, the uh, Dobzhansky and Meyer 
a notion of geographic speciation was the only way to make sense of my patterns in terms of modern evolutionary theory. I wrote these conclusions up in my 1969 uh, thesis, and I took that material and rewrote it for the journal Evolution, submitted in 1970 and published in 1971 as the allopatric model and phylogeny in Paleozoic invertebrates. Okay, so that's, that's this paper. It came out a year before punctuated equilibria. It had the geographic variation, had isolation, and it had stasis in it. But I didn't call it uh, anything like that. So that's important, but I don't want to leave that up. So let's just, I'll go back to this slide just to have this board in mind what the pattern looks like. Meanwhile, Steve had finished his evolutionary analysis of different stocks of Poecilozonides, that's the Bermuda snail, and in 1968 headed off to begin his impressive career at Harvard where he joined that rarefied group of evolutionary biologists that included Ernst Meyer, Dick Lewinton, uh, who we just saw, and E.O. Wilson, and overlapping just briefly with a great evolutionarily minded paleontologist, George Gaylord Simpson, who had spent most of his career also at the American Museum of Natural History. And so I stayed in New York and I accepted an appointment in, uh, at the American Museum and uh, an adjunct uh, professorship at Columbia. So our days of occupying nearby offices in Skirmahorn Hall at Columbia and attending seminars at the American Museum and perhaps most critically riding back and forth between Columbia and the museum several times a week on the number 11 bus were over. But those bus rides were amazing. Almost invariably Steve would launch into a soliloquy telling me a story about something or other he had recently read something intriguing to him that he had picked up in the literature. So he would give me sort of a spontaneous lectures on the bus. These rides were invariably entertaining and sometimes astonishing. I, so I had no trouble at all when the editor of Natural History magazine asked me if I could recommend someone to replace his outgoing columnist, my uh, former mentor and role model, the anthropologist Marvin Harris. Without giving it a second thought, I said, Steve Gould, he's never at a loss for words and always has a good story to tell, or words to that effect. And now we know what happened after that. He just went on and on and on with his, with his wonderful columns. But if the old student days were uh, together with our wives and fellow students were over, my working relationship with Steve, in a very real sense, was just getting going. Both Steve and I, as well as others, have written on the history of the production of the actual paper we entitled Punctuated Equilibria, an Alternative to Phyletic Gradualism. I'll put that up. Oh, no, no, that's, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to this for, for a moment. Um, it was published in a multi-authored book entitled Models in Paleobiology, edited by invertebrate paleontologist Tom Schopf. Fortunately, what I considered to be the definitive canonical history of the circumstances and events, including a detailed analysis of the manus manuscript as it went through its pre-publication revisions, specifying in detail who wrote what when, that's like when Dick said he wrote parts and Steve wrote parts of the Spandrels paper, has just been published <coughs> by historian David Sapkowski in his important new book, Rereading the Fossil Record, I recommend this to anybody who's got any interest in this aspect of Steve at all, or in, in the whole growth of a field. The Growth of Paleobiology as an Evolutionary Discipline. It's the University of Chicago Press. It's just out. Uh, Sapkowski reports that as the son of the late Jack Sapkowski, a marvelous early developer of quantitative taxic paleobiology, and not coincidentally one of Steve's very first graduate students, he was perhaps especially privy to the to files and archives pertaining to the development of the entire discipline in the 1970s and 80s, including the early contribution of punctuated equilibria. I find Sepkowski's account lucid and accurate and written with a dispassionate eye of an excellent historian. Indeed, it is somewhat prepossessing to find one's own actions and those of his colleagues from so long ago described so truthfully and to me as if it had happened just yesterday. Steve, I am sure, would have felt the same way had he survived to read David Sipkowski's book. It's a pity he didn't. So the details are all out there and readily available, and I need not belabor them here except to sketch briefly a few of the most basic points, and I urge you to consult Sipkowski for more detail. I think Steve would agree, in talking about the baseball now, in the immortal words of uh, the former Yankee manager Casey Stengel, now you could look it up. 
meaning uh, Sapkowski's book. So Steve had departed for Harvard and was well on his way, working, if anything, harder than ever and participating as fully as possible in intellectual activities within and even beyond the strict confines of paleontology. Steve heard about Tom Schopp's plan to organize a symposium for the 1971 Geological Society of America annual meeting, coupled with a book of the same title to be published afterwards. Hoping to join in, Steve unsurprisingly asked for the title Morph Models and Morphology, or perhaps Models and Phylogeny. Schaff told him that Dave Raup had already accepted the morphology assignment and Michael Giesland the one on phylogeny. Steve had to take the next best thing, so far unassigned, models in speciation. This whole book project was geared to make paleontology more theoretical. Steve evidently thought about it and then getting in touch with me said something to the effect that he couldn't think of much else to say beyond what I had written already and sent to him for comments, which was the allopatric model manuscript that was published in 1971 in Evolution he, that I just showed you. He asked me to be a co-author and I said sure. And either then or shortly thereafter he proposed that he give the talk at the meeting and be senior author while I would write the initial draft and be senior author of the published version of the paper. It sounded fine to me. I didn't especially like giving talks as Steve unnecessarily reminded me. And in any case, it always seemed far better to be senior author of a published paper than of an abstract of a talk at a symposium, which was precisely Dick Lewinton's point about the Spandrel's paper as well. Uh, when he said that he wished, Dick had wished he'd gone to, to London to give the, uh, the paper. I was already thinking that the two papers held the potential of igniting a lot of interest and perhaps controversy in paleontology, but also in evolutionary theory in general, primarily because one of the claims based on empirical evidence and held out to be general deviated far from the norm of conventional thinking. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. I wrote that first draft, including an account of Steve's thesis research on Bermudan snails, cast explicitly now into the context of the two main thematic components of our proposed theory. So, all right, so here's the, uh, here's the paper. Uh, not that that really is all that informative, but that's the f first page. I also added an extra discussion not previously agreed upon with Steve on what I saw was a major implication of punctuated equilibria. Steve came back with a greatly expanded essay, improving the rhetoric, making the argument more forceful, clarifying some concepts, and adding some thoughts on macroevolution of his own. And crucially, he named not only the theory itself, punctuated equilibria, but also the phenomenon of species stability through long periods of geological time, stasis, as well as the vision of adaptive evolutionary history comprising inex inexorable gradual modification of entire species through time, phyletic gradualism. There is a lot to names. In our title, Punctuated Equilibria, an, an alternative to phyletic gradualism, given what I just said about Steve's bestowal of names, was entirely Steve's own. That he did. I must say, however, that late in his life, I asked Steve about why he had started calling our baby punctuated equilibrium instead of the original punctuated equilibria. At first, he affected not to understand what I was even talking about and basically denied having done so. Whatever the reason, I personally dislike very much the term punctuated equilibrium, and I'm very happy that it's punctuated equilibria in the programming here uh, today. Okay, so what were these two, and I'll be very brief about this, thematic components of punctuated equilibria? Here they are. And there's a uh, misprint. I'm sorry. It should say morphological change at the bottom of this. This is the contrast between slow, steady, gradual change, one species changing into another through time, which is the fundamental picture that Darwin left us with, versus a, a picture of stability interrupted periodically by evolution and isolation rapidly producing new species in a sort of a horizontal way, if you will. And that's where most of the morphological change in evolution, according to us, actually occurs. So, contrary to popular belief and, and pr professional belief, and contrary especially to the enduring message of Charles Robert Darwin, 
Um, there is little, if any, empirical evidence that entire species will change slowly, gradually, and progressively through geological time. There are some examples, there are not very many of them, such that new species evolve gradually from old. Phyletic gradualism is a, not a valid general model for the generation of morphological change, adaptive or not, in the evolutionary history of life. Rather, species, however variable locally and geographically, typically do little more than oscillate, just they vary a little bit in space and through time, in terms of mean values of whatever morphological attribute through what can be astonishing long periods of time. In the case of marine invertebrates, usually five million years or even longer. This is what we meant by the term stasis. As to the second component, it was simply the application of Dobzhansky and Meyer's notion of geographic allopatric speciation. The origin of new species with at least a modicum of adaptive change, usually if not invariably detectable on the morphological level, to explain the appearance of species from off stage, from elsewhere, in isolation. And the common continuing pattern of geographic geographic replacement of closely related species or even what Darwin used to call varieties. And Darwin was the first person, I can't do this today, but uh, to equate uh, succession of species through time with succession of species in space, um, closely related species replacing one another. Morphological change in conjunction with the origin of new species and isolated population, a documented phenomenon in the modern fauna, thanks to the work of Dobzhansky and Meyer and all who followed them, simply must have been working as the norm, as the normal process throughout the history of complex life. Okay, now the section I added to my original manuscript on the importance of considering geographic speciation when addressing evolution in the fossil record, I'll just talk about it briefly addressed an apparent paradox. Because if evolution occurs in speciation mostly, but not through time like this, the old explanation for how you could get trends in the fossil record was no longer available to us. So what's going on? So I'll just uh, revert to my text here. But this was our diagram. I, dra I drafted this in 1972. Um, so it's a apparent paradox. If our thesis was true and if phyletic gradualism were in the main false, how do we explain evolutionary trends in the fossil record, such as the net increase in brain size and hominid evolution over the past few millions of years? After all, long-term orthoselection was ruled out in our model. That section concluded that there is a de facto pattern of net survival of some species over others, based on the phenotypic properties of individuals within those species that could well yield the trends we see to, seem to see in the fossil record. So in the one lineage on the right-hand side of the diagram, there's an apparent trend going on there by, by this, basically the selective uh, survival of species in a certain morphological direction and so forth, uh, whereas the, the lineage on the left is basically stable. Um, and, of course, this was the harbinger of many debates on species selection, I think most important of which probably is Elizabeth Verba's effect hypothesis, and also hierarchical thinking in evolutionary biology in general. So we were, we had that stuff in there in, in 72. All right, I'll just uh, turn the slides off for just a moment. So sure enough, there was a big reaction to our paper among our colleagues in the paleontological realm and increasingly in larger biological circles. Of course, we were happy for the relatively few who congratulated us on finally bringing paleontology out of the dark ages, which is what we liked. Others said they knew it all along, which may or may not have been true, while still others castigated us for being the ignorant renegades they took us to be. Steve said, yeah, people are, are uh, saying that they know about speciation, and it was sort of an insult to paleontologists to be lectured on in our paper, but he said they might know about it, but they don't apply it to their research, and he was right. He had very good insight on that. So it was Steve's final rewriting and his consistently bold rhetoric which really did the trick in terms, at least, of commanding attention, if not universal approval. We had posted a manifesto that could not be ignored, unlike my 1971 paper that had basically sunk without a trace. I mean, we got a lot of attention on this paper. It was largely because of Steve. At Steve's urging, we wrote a Where Are We Now follow-up paper five years later, publishing it in the new-fledged journal Paleobiology. 
Steve, this time, wrote the entire manuscript, inviting me to add, delete, and so on, but I, all I ended up doing was sitting, him, sitting with him one afternoon in his motel room at yet another autumnal um, geological society meeting, arguing about one single, but to my mind, vital point about the paper. Steve had used the word tempo a lot in the manuscript, and Dick Lewinson characterized this stuff as only about tempo also. Steve seemed to see that as well. And he was in effect saying that our original paper was essentially just about variable evolutionary rates. In fact, his working title for this second paper was Punctuated Equilibria, the Tempo of Evolution Reconsidered. I was appalled as I had all along had George Simpson's distinction, and Dick mentioned this, of evolutionary tempo and evolutionary mode firmly in mind, as developed originally and best in Simpson's 44 book, Tempo and Mode in Evolution. Indeed, Simpson was the unacknowledged inspiration for our temerity in asserting that paleontologists looking at the fossil record could say anything original about evolution. Simpson made it clear that not all paleontological evolutionary patterns can be easily and accurately explained by simply extrapolating known genetic mechanisms as revealed in laboratory or even pencil and paper mathematical uh, population genetics. Such patterns call for additional theories, such as Simpson had adduced <clears throat> in his original quantum evolution model for the orig rapid origin of higher taxa. But the Simpson speciation is a mode, not a tempo. It's a style of evolution. It's completely different from just gradual selective change through time. So was quantum evolution. I badgered Steve for what seemed like hours, and finally he agreed to add end mode, two words and mode absolutely everywhere he had written tempo in the manuscript, including, of course, its very title. I tell this last story because it highlights something Steve and I have said to each other periodically over the years. Steve and I, of course, agreed about most things, but so what? It was when we were disagreeing, arguing, sometimes damn near fighting, in other words, when there was half a chance you could learn something that we were really having fun. I feel moved to close this reflection on Steve Gould in the 60s and 70s and our work together on punctuated equilibria with some new insights I have been fortunate to have had within the past six months or so. They concern the thoughts of the young Charles Darwin, writing his secret transmutation notebooks between late 1837 and 1839 when he was between the ages of 28 and 30, which is ironically about the same age that we were when we were thinking about all these issues. Darwin, of course, was the man who once and for all founded the profession of evolutionary biology. Not that he did not have his own predecessors, but that's, of course, another story. It was Darwin who left us with the dominant picture of evolution through time as necessarily slow, steady, and gradual, the result of natural selection modifying entire species as the ages roll on and environments inver invariably change, inevitably change. That was the image that we were attacking, and although we have been accused of attacking a straw man of our own devising, anyone who takes a clear, objective look at Darwin's 1842 and 1844 unpublished manuscripts, his late, uh, his mid-1850s also unpublished Big Species book, which he was going to have called uh, Natural Selection, and most importantly, of course, the 1859 and later editions of On the Origin of Species, will perforce agree that this is indeed by far the dominant view of long-term evolution that Darwin developed and left us with. In other words, gradual phyletic change, phyletic gradualism. And his successors more or less faithfully continued to mouth this model, as Dick said, until Steve and I came along in the early 1970s. But not so the young and far more interesting Charles Darwin, when he was a young guy. In my view, he can be documented via his notebooks contemplating transmutation as early as the fall of 1832 while collecting fossils at Bahia Blanca in Argentina. But it was only after his return home and as an openly avowed evolution, if only to himself, as shown in his 1837 red notebook, that Darwin felt he had finally to confront the gorilla in the room, a natural explanation, a causal mechanism for adaptation. Prior to that, Darwin had proceeded by adopting Brokey's analogy, the Italian uh, person who came from Bassano del Grappa, not too far from here, that the births and deaths of species are as much the product of natural causes as are the births and deaths of individuals. That's Brokey's analogy. 
was a myth that Darwin came to evolution through a theory of adaptation through natural selection is just that, a myth. But of course, adaptation is a hugely real evolutionary phenomenon. Even Steve agreed. Darwin finally tackled it in his notebook B, invoking the spirit of his grandfather Erasmus' Zoonomia book for inspiration and perhaps even courage as he took the plunge. Darwin knew that adaptation somehow fell out of the simple fact of heredity as well as the existence of heredi heritable variation. But something more was needed. Something was missing and it would take Darwin another full year and the completion of his first two transmutation notebooks, B and C, before he found Malthus and had his three-part syllogism of natural selection completed. Yet not daunted by lacking a complete and cogent mechanism for the process of adaptation in late 1837, Darwin plunged on, convinced that such a law of adaptation must exist, and determined eventually to find it, as he did a year later. The question then became, though, under what circumstances is that law of adaptation usually manifested? Darwin knew from his own data and observations gathered on the Beagle between 1831 and 1836 that new varieties and species arise in isolation, most easily seen on islands, of course, and especially on separate islands within an archipelago. The Galapagos mockingbirds, not the finches, the mockingbirds are the canonical example, but he had other examples as well, including, as he saw it at least, the different foxes of the two main islands of the Falklands or Malvinas Islands in the Atlantic Ocean. After he reached home in late 1836, he had plenty of other putative examples from the literature. So he knew about evolution in isolation. And of course, such geographically disjunct and often still isolated varieties and species are morphologically distinct. That's how you know them apart in the first place. Therefore, adaptive change occurs in isolated populations when such populations encounter new to the ancestral species environments or the environments change. In other words, Darwin knew about geographic speciation and correlated or associated adaptive change. It is, after all, how he came to accept the existence of evolution transmutation in the first place. He also knew that species have what seemed to him to have a distressing tendency to remain stable, therefore, uh, 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 that is, not to change much, if at all, through what he called thick formations of rock, meaning rather long periods of time, geological time. On the other hand, Darwin had a hard time imagining how isolation could happen with any degree of regularity over the vast expanses of continental interiors, such as all of South America south of the Amazon basin. He knew nothing about glaciation or other aspects of climate change that can partition and rearrange habitats over continental areas. And yet there were so many more species on continents than on islands and even on archipelagos. So Darwin, without any evidence, and indeed in spite of evidence to the contrary, began to think that this black box motor of adaptive change must willy-nilly also account for much of the adaptive change in evolution. He became even more convinced after he nailed down his full understanding of natural selection in 1838. So gradual phyletic change was his second rather different model of where, when, and how adaptation occurs in the evolutionary picture. And he came to see these two models, these two images of where and when and how adaptation occurs in the evolutionary process as somehow antithetical as alternatives to one another. To my knowledge, neither Dobzhansky or Meyer saw the two as antithetical. So we must ask briefly why Darwin did. Darwin saw that geographic speciation was adequate to explain observed morphological change in the history of life. But he couldn't see that uh, evolution, geographic uh, speciation evolution and isolation happened all that frequently so the dominant role had to be played by something else, his model of gradual progressive uh, change, which he later modified in the, in the origin in complex ways to form his principle of divergence. In other words, geographic speciation could do the job if it happened regularly and most adaptive change would happen in the brief spurts of speciation events. But Darwin concluded that evolution and isolation simply does not happen sufficiently regularly or even or often enough to constitute a general model of adaptive change in the evolutionary history of life. You can see where I'm going here. So, so toward the end of Notebook E, this is really stunning, 
presumably sometime in 1839, early 1839, Darwin wrote this sentence, which I personally find to be amazing. He says, if separation in horizontal direction is far more important in making species than time as cause of change, which can hardly be believed, then uniformity in geological formation intelligible. So uh, let me translate that to you, for you, in terms of the punctuated equilibrium model. Here it is. If separation in horizontal direction, allopatric speciation, is far more important in making species than time, phyletic gradualism, as cause of change, which can hardly be believed for reasons I just told you, then uniformity in geological formation, stasis, intelligible, or just taking the whole thing and using Steve's terms, our terms, but Steve coined them, if allopatric, well not, Steve didn't coin allopatric speciation, that was Meyer and Dobzhansky. If allopatric speciation is far more important in making species than phyletic gradualism as cause of change, which can hardly be believed, then stasis intelligible. He had the whole thing figured out, but he re he's rejecting it. He's, re you know, that just blows my mind. Okay. So, so I say, so exactly so. Like Dobzhansky and Meyer before us, Steve and I had to return to the fork in the road that y Darwin had encountered in the late 1830s. And Siri Adams, starting with Dobzhansky and Meyer, then Steve and I came along. We redeveloped the path that Darwin knew about but did not take, really. And now here's another baseball thing. If Steve were here, he would say, as Yogi Berra used to say, if, when you reach a fork in the road, take it. And <laughs> Darwin took one fork, we took the other, along, following after uh, Dobzhansky and Meyer. But I have one final thought, and I'll leave you with that, and thank you for your patience. Had Darwin seen the title of our 1972 paper, particularly when he too was a young man in the late 1830s, he would have been intrigued but would have insisted on the change of but a single word. Darwin would have insisted on punctuated equilibria, the alternative to phyletic gradualism. Steve always hated to be edited, but I think in this case he would be pleased at the suggestion that ours was not just an alternative, but the alternative to the standard Darwinian image of evolution through time. Phyletic gradualism. Thank you very much. Grazie.